It's funny if they're just trying to one-up each other and, and Xi Jinping just comes out and goes, all right, I'm buying Iceland then, or something like that. <laughs> and they're all just yeah. dicking about. It's just well, this colossal willy-waving competition. So. Well, the Chinese have already megalomania. Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. I'm back and Jamie's not with us this week. So as well as Ian, we've got Way from telecoms.com. Hi, Way. Yeah. Um, right, I'm going to crack straight into it because shortly after this, we're all going to go off and play ping pong together in a sort of worky larks sort of way. Um, uh, what? Oh, yeah, just to remind you that if you're watching it on the site or on YouTube or on Facebook, you can also listen to it on SoundCloud or iTunes or countless other platforms and vice versa. You haven't okay. lost it. You haven't lost your touch. I haven't lost a week. A week in <laughs> Suffolk, and, I, and it's like I've never left. Uh, it was Suffolk. You, I, I noticed yeah, when I was editing the podcast, you said Norfolk, yeah. well, Norfolk same slash. Thing, isn't it? Well, it probably was quite near the border, so I'll, I'll East let Anglia. You, I'll give you that one somewhere. Yeah. India. Um, uh, what are we can talk about? Okay, we're not going to talk about Suffolk. Funnily enough, um, we're going to talk about Huawei, as we often do. Uh, we're also going to talk more broadly about China, the geopolitical spat um, and the implications for China. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about three, as you have previously. So some fairly sort of recurrent themes, but we've only got about half an hour for this one. Yeah. So we're just going to plow on. Mm. Right. Huawei. Um, the the thing that caught my eye was something I wrote yesterday about um, this entity list. I, it's a sort of list that the US puts companies or even countries on, although I don't know if they call it the entity list for countries. But the US reserves the right to go, right, if you go anywhere near this country or company, then you can't do any business with us. And it being the US, the implications of that are quite severe. So it's a very powerful sort of geopolitical weapon for the US to use. And about three months ago, they went, right, we're betting Huawei on this list. Mm -hmm. Because various reasons, partly we reckon that they've done business with Iran, which is on our country's list, partly because um, we reckon we caught their CFO sort of coming up with shell companies and other dodgy ways of sort of defrauding or, or, or deceiving our, our financial services sector, mm -hmm. if I remember rightly. Um, and partly because we just think generally the whole situation is a bit too dodgy, as we've been over loads of times. We reckon that there's no way Huawei doesn't have to hand over data to the Chinese state mm. when, the, when the Chinese state asks for it. And we're in the middle of casting deep suspicion towards yeah, the Chinese in, state. Intellectual property theft and stuff like that. Oh, yes. Like and then there's that. a historical IP theft, uh, as which, they've, which they've dredged up again. Mm. Um, and so they put them on this entity list, which basically they did that to ZTE a year or two ago, and it nearly killed the company outright. Mm. So it's an incredibly powerful thing to do because it's basically an export ban that stops anyone, any U.S. companies or any companies that want to stay in the good books of the U.S. from doing business with, with Huawei. Now, Huawei obviously has a lot of intellectual property of its own, at least some of which is developed by itself. Well, there, there is another key difference between two cases, between right. ZTE and Huawei, that not being often talked about is when ZTE was being punished, the Chinese government didn't come out to defend it. Hmm. And Good point. when it comes And I to thought ZTE was actually closer to the Chinese yeah, state. Exactly. ZTE is well, actually like is as a state-owned enterprise. Yeah. Right. And Huawei um, is, was, has been repeatedly declared to be a private company. Yeah. So the way that the Chinese company, uh, the, the Chinese government treats the two companies is completely different or from one be. another. Um, it should be different, yeah. but it should be the other way around. Quite. Yeah. I suppose you could argue that the evidence against ZT on the sanction busting, the doing business with Iran stuff was stronger. Is, that, is there something in that? Um, well, they, they basically accepted culpability, didn't they? Because right. as soon as you, the difference with ZTE and Huawei is that ZTE made changes, it made staff changes, yeah. it agreed to pay yeah. a fine, it, it agreed to have the US come in and, and look at its... So that's, it that's my point. So, would, would it's it, always insisting that it's doing nothing wrong. Which, which mm -hmm. to me says maybe the evidence was stronger against ZT for them to fess up. Yeah, or it, maybe they just... Isn't it about whoever brings in more the most billion dollars? Well, it and could be that it. as it well. Could, yes. very right. Purely it about the money. Case. Yeah, exactly. yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but the point still remains is that the US has created an environment whereby it could cut off Huawei from basically international trade mm. in the same way it did ZTE, which nearly killed ZTE. Now, the latest development is when it put it on the entity list, it then about a week later went, all right, we'll put it off for three months. And the reason given was that um, 
Trump said he'd been lobbied by various sort of mm. domestic uh, companies to say, look, you can't just do that, mate. You've got to give us a chance to adjust our mm. our you know supply chains or, or our business dealings or whatever. Yeah. The latest one being Tim Cook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm leading. I'm leading up to that. Stop stealing yeah. my thunder. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so that was three months ago, and then we're coming up. I think it was it was August the nineteenth was supposed to be when that suspend that that temporary suspension expired, and and the NC list thing was going to kick in. But then he went and had uh, dinner with Tim Cook mm. and stuff like that, and they all went, look, it's still not happening. It's just still going to cause us loads of aggro. I think Tim Cook. Said some other stuff. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, he. Uh, well, at least Trump said Tim Cook told him that the one that will benefit will be Samsung because yeah. Samsung is a South Korean company and is not paying the tariff that you're levying on the Chinese. Okay. Components. So his suppliers. point was more more the broader, the more the sort of trade war, yeah. tariff war type yeah. of thing. Mm. So there've been a, so a variety of reasons why people are pressuring Trump to just chill out a little bit, mm. and so then. The, the, the BIS, I've forgotten what it stands for, Bureau of Mucking About With Stuff, um, said, all right, and yeah, we're going to extend it by another three months. Mm. And and when that happened, when I wrote up, I was thinking, well, hold on a sec. And the reason was given this time to, for consumers to adjust, yeah. which seems even more spurious to me because it's pretty hard to get hold of Huawei gear in the States anyway. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rural carriers that use its equipment. I right, think that's, but um, but specifically, the BIS announcement was talking about allowing consumers to adjust. Yeah. Now I got for uh, for the holiday season. Or yeah, it's customers, customers, I yeah. think. Wasn't it? I think it said consumers. I haven't got it. Up, I, mean, so. I thought it's mainly, I think, aimed at helping rural carriers. Okay, to fair adjust, enough. Basically, but, because they use a lot of them use Huawei equipment. Well, and networks. that's a, and that's a more and, coherent reason. But and uh, they've been under pressure not to have what so the big carriers can't use Huawei in their networks because they have government contracts. They've mm. been warned off using it for ages. But the the rural the ones rural still carriers, can. I think, are under yeah. pressure not to. The reason, by the way, that Huawei's on the entity list isn't anything to do with um, with with, yeah. with Iran yeah. or, or 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 trade violations. That's not the reason it's on the entity list. The reason it's on the entity list is because it's seen to be a national security threat. So the the case against Main Wanzhou, which mm. is yeah. still not started, because I think there's still probably some kind of battle going on over extradition. Yeah. And just that's the, the whole point of that is to prove that they did mm. something wrong in Iran, that they sold you know gear in Iran that included U.S. components, and they went and lied about it to U.S. bankers, and the outcome yeah. of that would presumably mean they can justify p- imposing more sanctions on Huawei or doing something else. Yeah. I don't know, but the reason they're on the Entity list is actually specifically to do with the national security risk. Okay, they pose. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Uh, let me. I've I've looked at the story uh, and I've got a couple of quotes from this Bureau of Industry and Security, which is BIS, which is the agency that's in charge of this stuff. It says um, it refers to un- unspecified quote activities that are contrary to U.S. national security or foreign policy interests. Now, I think that includes what you said and what I said. I think they're keeping. I think they're casting the net wider. Mm. I think they're basically when they talk about foreign policy interest, that could be almost anything, couldn't it? Well, it could, but they've not. I mean, the the, the big difference with ZTE is that it was found guilty mm. right. of, and then it admitted culpability, yeah, and yeah. then therefore there was a fine, and, yeah, when, yeah. and then they were found to have done things again and not not kind so of. So that's back to what we're saying earlier. The, the evidence is isn't so the whole, strong. The whole stuff about um, deal, you know, selling gear in Iran, mm. they've they've not actually, you know, as I understand it, that's not really had any kind of real outcome from Fair that. They're certainly not, and they're fighting that at the moment. So, but the national security thing, which is a much more, I think, it's probably easier to get away with doing things like this on the basis of national security because you don't have to tell people what's going on. You can just have suspicions and. You know, if your intelligence agencies think there's some kind of risk, then that's justification enough to yeah. not have dealings with a company, basically. So, fair enough. That, back to my, the point about why they're extending it. I've got a quote here from the BAS announcement um, that this time it's extended quote to afford consumers across America the necessary time to transition because Americans can't say move; but they've like, got to say transition yeah. to transition away from Huawei equipment. So, yeah, this it's, is but it's consumers of Huawei equipment. I don't think yeah. they mean consumers there in the sense of companies that are consuming Huawei equipment. I don't think they mean Huawei smartphone owners because. All right, but whenever we say consumers, we're talking about punters, we're talking about end users, aren't we? Yeah, we are. But it could no, be the no, we'll, semantical we'll say, thing. We would say customers if it were about, well, let's say, rural carriers. Anyway. Well, you, when you say consumers, normally you mean people like... At very least, they're yeah. using very woolly language. I think we can all agree on that. And and my, the point I'm leading up to on this is I just think their, their justifications for doing it are vague. Their, the reasons for suspending each time are vague. 
Um, and I just think it's increasingly looking like a, an empty bluff. It's increasingly to me looking like Trump has created this big threat. He's basically gone to China. We're going to sh** your proxy, i.e. Huawei, unless you, unless you give us the concessions we want on things like tariffs, on things like currency manipulation, on things, on things like security. And China, to the best of my knowledge, just just gone gone then. Mm. And then each time the deadline comes and China hasn't shifted, they're putting it off. How many more times do they have to extend it for 90 days for us to conclude it's all a complete bluff? That's my point of view, but I know you don't necessarily completely concur well, with that. Yeah. I mean, if they do it again, I suppose, it, it, I don't know if it's a bluff so much, but I guess they could be accused of not following through on the threat if they keep extending it. Um, yeah. I mean, they obviously want to hurt Huawei because there's lots of other things they've done. And, and, and the action of putting it on the list in the first place has caused a huge amount of pain for Huawei. It's totally. caused a huge amount of disruption. They're running around the world telling governments to ban it. Australia's done that. New Zealand's yeah. imposed restrictions. Some operators have said they're not going to use it. So there's obviously an anti-Huawei campaign going on. Um, I think what's happened, which you mentioned earlier, is there's been a huge lobbying effort after, you know, after they've put the, the, the name Huawei on the entity list. Yeah. And they've had to push back. They've had to sort of, you know, oh, it's going to cause... It's you mean lobbying cause, from, from U.S. Lobbying companies? Lobbying from U.S. Yeah. companies, you know, whether it's Apple or whether it's rural carriers that are using equipment. Um, I mean, the smartphone side of things, I'm not really sure. Like you say, I can't imagine there's that many no, I don't think smartphones, smartphones being used, are, are really, big, in America. Yeah, yeah so, which is why I found the consumer bit a bit baffling. It's more baffling. the, gear, but, it's more the gears. But the gear yeah. on the gear side and on things like Tim Cook saying, look, if you do this, it's mm. going to hurt us more than it hurts Samsung. And, mm. you know, and it's not just... It's not just that; it's companies like Qualcomm. Even I think derives a certain percentage of its revenues from sales oh, to, to, to Huawei, and some of them derive a lot more than that. And, and I'm not even talking about the ones like Neophotonics and Lamentum that are really small companies. There are some quite big players that get a, a big chunk of revenues from yeah. Huawei. So I think they've they've come under a lot of lobbying pressure not to follow through with it, and they've they've kind of pulled back. And yeah, if they keep doing that, then it starts to become an empty threat. I it suppose, does, and it makes it? it it makes it at the very least look like a very badly thought out. And I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone who watches well, Trump, even yeah. people who aren't Trump phobic, who haven't mm. got Trump derangement syndrome. You know, he's he's obviously impulsive. Mm. Uh, he's obviously well. Denmark's in, not worth talking to anymore, is it? Because they don't want to sell Greenland. <laughs> yeah, so, that's you know. so funny. <laughs> then he decided to postpone I mean, his visit. See, I don't even I don't even know what to make of that. Uh, who suddenly comes out and goes? I'm the, buying his, Greenland. His tweet on it was brilliant, though. It's something like, they don't want to discuss Greenland. I don't want to meet them anymore I or something. Yeah. What's, What's, playing underneath? What's underneath Greenland that he wants so much? A lot of mineral resources. I know. Yeah. And they you don't can, care about melting the ice caps down more quickly. To you get can bet the Danes are sending a bunch, of, a bunch of prospectors over there right now going, have we missed something here? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, that's all. That's all very bizarre, and that that just adds to this this sense of sort of Trump utter chaos. For him to just suddenly come out and go right, I'm buying green, and what next? So, right, I'm building a <laughs> hotel on the moon, or something. You just never know, and, and then you never know, and you never know when he's trolling either, because he sent this, he sent this, I thought quite funny tweet, where he said, "I'm not going to do this," and he'd photoshopped Trump Tower onto Greenland. And going, I'm not going to build Trump Tower and Green. You just wonder whether he's just dicking about half the time. I mean, I don't think he drinks, but he acts like well, he's pissed yeah. half the time. Yeah. Anyway, mm. um, he might be on something else. Yes, well, it could be. It could be. I mean, Joe Rogan speculates, speculates that he's on Adderall or something like that. Diet pills. Yeah. I mean, in the states, you can get hold of so much more pretty tasty pharmaceuticals well, they're trying to over prove the counter. Insane at one stage, you're not fit to. Yeah, they've had a go at that. They've had a go and at again, that. there's an like anecdotal that. evidence to support that. And yet, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's and then other people talk about 4D chess, and is it all just this extreme cleverness that's going? It's, it's impossible to work out. But you know, to bring it to bring it back to the the geopolitical thing. I mean, wait. My my impression is that for all this bluster and all this threatening Huawei, I don't think China's made that much in the way of concessions have you, have you no, been aware of any? no that that was um my impression as well i mean every three months they say oh, well, I'll, I'll postpone it i'll um suspend the the tariffs on the on the chinese goods and we'll continue with the trade talks and you you would think that trump sort of um positioned himself as the um as the best negotiator and when you negotiate i give in a bit and you giving a bit yeah. so um well, that could explain why he wanted to uh suspend the the tariffs but you don't see anything the the chinese have, no. uh, have, it's have the given it's the art so. of the deal 
Well, quite. So yeah. what's the art? You know, I know I know you haven't lived there for a while, and I'm not going to just typecast you yeah. as the Chinese bloke in the room. But, you know, do you have any sense of, of where she's coming from and all this? Do you think he's just willing to just dig his heels in and, and stare Trump down? Do you have any sort of instinct about where he's coming from? Well, I this? think his biggest advantage over, over the Americans is he will be there for long term. Right. Especially after... So he's got they, time. Yeah, but they, 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 I mean, the, the, the worst they can do is to just to bite the time. And he, he's, well, recently they've uh, removed the term limit, so he could be yeah, in power as, yeah, as long as, 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 as he likes. Life. Yeah, then, and Trump, maximum, they have to bear with him for another five years. Yes. So, um, Unless he ty- changes the constitution. Yeah. And ty- it's true. <laughs> he's, he's talked about doing it, hasn't he? Like, like Roosevelt. Didn't he make some anyway. comment about, oh, they've changed the Chinese constitution? Maybe this so is why can't I? Do in a tweet yeah. ages ago. Yeah, that's right. Well, It'd be no. funny, if, <clears throat> funny if they're just trying to one-up each other and... and Xi Jinping just comes out and goes, right, I'm buying Iceland then, or something like that. <laughs> and they're all just dicking yeah. about. It's just well, this colossal Africa, willy-waving Chinese, competition. So. Well, the, the Chinese have already bought Africa. Yeah. So. The funny war. Mm. So, so talking about that, there's, there's, there's another thing to do with China that I also wrote about. It's a bit of a tangent, but it's interesting in this sort of broader what, what are Trump and Xi Jinping up mm. to, which is we've got these protests going on in Hong Kong right mm-hmm. now. Which, um, my understanding of their origin is that China wanted to, well, Hong Kong wanted to pass a law that would f- greatly f- facilitate the extradition of Hong Kong people to mainland China. And obviously, Hong Kong, it used to be uh, a British colony. We handed it over about 20 odd years ago. Yeah, 22 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but Hong Kong's still semi autonomous from China. Mm. It's, not, it's not subject to a lot of the laws and restrictions mm. that, like, for example, they can get like sort of normal, like Google and stuff, can't they? Yeah. In Hong Kong, we haven't got the great firewall of China applying that. Mm. And obviously, every time a law passes that it looks like Hong Kong's going to be more absorbed into greater China, the people who live in Hong Kong get mm. quite alarmed for, for lots of obvious reasons. Mm. And so they've been protesting this stuff. Um, and it's turned into quite a big sort of global PR thing because the protests mm. are so big uh, and the and the stakes are so high. But the the reason it's sort of relevant to us, other than me being self-indulgent and mm. quite enjoying chatting about geopolitical stuff anyway, um, is that Twitter and Facebook have both, they've done two things. They've suspended a bunch of accounts that they trace back to the Chinese state mm. that were, although you don't get Twitter and Facebook in the Chinese mainland, yeah. they're obviously trying to spread some propaganda internationally mm. that were basically trying to discredit the Hong Kong protests, uh, according to them. Yes. that's Yeah, that's um, that's what Twitter says in, in yeah. their statement, at least. I haven't read the one from Facebook. Yeah, well, if, Facebook if basically went, Twitter, Twitter told us to do this. So yeah, that's right. It. There's yeah. this real sort of mm. collusion that goes yeah. on. Yeah. And then Twitter also at the same time, someone flagged up that there were these um, sponsored posts from people like, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, Xinhua News? Yes. Yeah. Uh, did that, was that all right? Yes. That close? That's, Check that's you out. Pretty. Check me out. You've yeah. been brushing up on your lingo skills. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is state-owned Chinese media, of, of which there's plenty. Yes. Yeah, there's yeah. Global Times. News, there's a few that are... Yeah. State owned. China Just a, Daily, where's that one from? What's that one? That's, that's the actual also, party. There's also the yeah, yeah. state owned, but the, well, what's the difference between the yes. state and the party? Um, I guess so. Yeah. But there's, there's a bunch of them that, that are clearly not editorially independent in the way that us, us uh, um, journalists with integrity in the West are. <laughs> um, and, and of course, they're going to write stuff that is sympathetic to the Chinese state's case mm. and, and thus antagonistic mm. to the Hong Kong protesters. I think they're quite subtle about it. You know, they're mm. not just trying to paint them all as, as the devil. No. But, but mm. it's, a, it's, it's a long game of, of sort of propaganda. Mm. And, and they were accepting these as sponsored posts, so they've come up with another announcement saying it's not going to do that. So I just think that's an interesting thing. As part of this big geopolitical chess game that's being played right now, I think, and I'll, again, I'll hand it back to you, Wei, because I know we've chatted about Hong Kong, and it's, and it's a really interesting test case. It, in terms of China's position in the international community, and it clearly aspires to be a bigger international player, we've got yeah. things like the Belt and Road mm. Initiative and all that sort of thing. You know, I read somewhere comparing this Hong Kong situation to Tiananmen Square like 30-odd mm-hmm. years ago, mm. where... Exactly 30 years ago, actually. It was, mm-hmm. okay, yeah. right. Mm. Where international outrage at what went on there was so great that it really set China back in mm. terms of its international standing. 
Uh, and I was wondering, do you think that this Hong Kong thing could could end up being a sort of similar situation? Well, there are plenty of uh, analysis recently, basically saying that, that there's a high likelihood that it might descend into such a tragedy as uh, 30 years yeah. ago, um, and there will there will be um, yeah plenty of speculation what would happen, and there were sort of pictures taken as the Chinese military forces. I saw that, a bunch of yeah, trucks all yeah. lined up. In a stadium, arm, yeah. yeah. armed vehicles and uh, basically just staying on the border waiting for the order to, to march Do you know what on. I mean, if the Hong Kong government just gives them the all clear, God knows what could happen. Well, they don't need the Chinese, the, the Hong Kong government to give them the all clear. They, they will listen I suppose to, not. No, but for the, for the, for the veneer of respectability, not just sending yeah. the lads in willy-nilly. That's right, yeah. Um, but but back, to the, back to the discussion, I think there are, there are two things that um, sort of conflated together. One is the, the Hong Kong demonstration and how to, how to view it. And you see clearly there are two stories and one one's inside China and the other is the rest of the world. Um, are the Chinese government and their mouthpieces delivering misinformation? Well, absolutely. Then should those Twitter accounts be banned? I'm not so sure. I just, I just, I just don't quite turn my head around uh, on the ban. Is that just from a censorship point of view? Yeah, I mean, um, the thing is, there are plenty of accounts who are delivering false information yes. or just being abusive um, on other users or just simply being abusive. That's Twitter um, sort of exactly. in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah, then, then how many accounts will you, will you ban? Well, quite. And, yeah. and that's a broader, which we, which we don't have the time for, but you and I certainly off camera often talk about this um, freedom of speech side yeah. of things. And yeah. yeah, to what extent... It, there's, there's, a, there's a very arbitrary system of deciding what's it beyond is. the pale and what yeah. isn't. There doesn't yeah. seem to be any rigor to it. No. Okay, no, no. I'm, I'm getting uh, watch gestures from Pierre. Mm. So we've got one more thing that I'm going to hand over to Ian. This is back to the sort of Huawei issue. Um, so with all this pressure being put on Huawei, largely it seems as a proxy for the Chinese state. But some operators, even in countries like the UK where where they're under a lot of pressure not to use Huawei, still are. And you had a chat with the CEO of 3UK, didn't you? Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so they, I mean, we were talking about this on the last podcast as well, um, in the sense that 3's just launched its yeah. 5G service. Um, so that was a reason for meeting Dave Dyson, who's the CEO. Right. Um, and Any relation to... He's not a relation to the Hoover guy, no. But, no. Um, but he should... James. He should be, yeah. <laughs> um, James Dyson, yeah. Um, and their 5G launch is a little bit different than the Vodafone and BT ones in that they're kind of going after the broadband market. It's a broadband offer at the moment, not a mobile one. Yeah. Um, but fixed wireless access. Fixed yeah. wireless access, yeah. But um, the interesting thing to me, to me about 3 is that they're, um, and I asked, I asked Dave Dyson this, they're, they're kind of very, very heavily reliant on Huawei in the ra- okay. on the radio side. So, right. And all the UK operators have a, a, a relationship with Huawei. But on the RAN side. On the RAN side. None of them got it in the core. Um, no, that's not, three, BT does have it in the core. Three is, oh, right. is using them for the core, right? For three is not G, using them for the core. G. Three deliberately took a decision not to use oh. Huawei in the core, right. uh, in Dave Dyson's words, because right. of the risks. But on the RAN side, they are all in with three, uh, all in with Huawei yeah. for five G. And as a result of that, they're having to take out some of the old four G equipment that they've had from right. a different supplier, which is Samsung. I and see. introduce Huawei's four G equipment as well. So they have one five G RAN supplier, which is Huawei. Um, and you know, while that's while that's been going on, and they've you know drawn up this contract and started rolling out this network, and that process is going to carry on for the next few months and years, the UK government's still weighing this decision about whether to actually yeah. impose a ban on Huawei, um, which would obviously be which catastrophic. Would be catastrophic. If it's a full ban, if it's what Australia's done, which is yeah. basically to ban Huawei entirely from the five G market. And all the all the UK operators are lobbying against this, and it would be an extremely, you know, it would be a very extreme measure. But if they did do that, then you sort of feel that three would be in a worse position than looks like um, it. than BT or Vodafone, which um, also use Huawei but have other other RAN supplies in the mix. So in BT's case, it's Nokia, um, and in Vodafone's case, it's mainly Ericsson. Um, and I mean, I, I I asked Dave Dyson this, and he he sort of you know, he resisted the um, 
charge that they're kind of more vul- more at risk right. than other operators. I mean, but he actually how? said, how did he well, he it? said that. I mean, his main um, argument was that the fact that they haven't used it in the core makes them in a much be- puts them in a much better position than BT. He said that trying to get that, mm. you know, I mean, BT has actually started a process of trying to take. Huawei out of the core, yeah. and it, it only uses Huawei in the core because it bought an operator EE that that had its equipment there. It's oh, right. always been BT's policy not to use it. Okay, but a- after acquiring EE, they suddenly found themselves with Huawei equipment in the core and have mm-hmm. had to start taking it out. But Dave Dyson was like, "That's a really complicated process. It's like you know, it's basically like performing brain surgery, and I wouldn't want to mm. be in that position." But he's clearly prepared to Is take it like the rocket risk. science as well. <laughs> I think he's, he is because he won't have to do it. He's obviously he's obviously yeah. prepared to take a risk on the, uh, on the RAND, on the RAND side. side. And he, but he's he saying worst comes just, to the worst, I can sort the RAND stuff. Well, out. his his justification was that it was it was almost like the risk of not moving on five G is greater than the risk. Yeah, of, well, of there the is government ban. So it's, he's basically looked at his options and he said, if we don't go now, you know, three's got a subscale operator in the UK. It's never really been able to get above ten million, eleven million subscribers. Yeah, it's never had a fixed line business. And they've got this, um, he says they've got this massive opportunity to, to position 5G as a broadband service. Yeah. Uh, you don't pay a line rental charge. There's a huge price um, advantage. You know, they've got loads of spectrum, which he says gives them, you know, this ability to provide very kind of competitive services in terms of the speed. If they don't take advantage of yeah. that, then they're basically... No, spot on. So he's got to take the risk. In fact, that so reminds me, just the last thing, the if, you'll, if you'll bear with me, Pierre, for a couple of minutes. Uh, the last it's, it's, we have to go. It's up to you. <laughs> uh, the uh, This reminds me of another thing I wrote about yesterday. So 3 is in a great position, certainly in terms of the amount of spectrum it's got. And I wrote a story that... Um, EE has grasped three up to the advertising oh, yeah, the, standards yeah, the advertising authority yeah. because it's come out with an ad campaign that says it's the only real yeah. uh, 5G. Mm. Um, and uh, and then I had a chat with uh, EE and three um, and to some extent the ASA, although I just got a statement out of them as to you know what all this comes down to. And basically it comes down to, this is a little bit technical, I won't go into too much, it comes down to whether or not you've got a contiguous chunk of 100 megahertz, mm. uh, which only three has. Mm. Um, so three says that means it's only real. E says, no, nah, that's bull****. And what about like carry aggregation and non-contiguous chunks and all that sort of thing? And then there's the ITU that says that, yes, for 5G, there is a minimum of 100 yeah, megahertz that increasingly required. Increasingly irrelevant organization. Is it? Mm. Okay, so we we think that, that's I didn't I didn't Which have a, a standards sense. group anyway. It's not a standard. Okay, so well, that's something I missed yeah. in my coverage of it was the significance or otherwise of the ITU in the first place. But I mean, look, I don't want to get into that one because we're running out of time. But one thing that occurred to me, well, two things: the ASA is not equipped to make a call on what's no, real five G. No. I mean, I personally think that real. I think they made a mistake saying real. Yeah. If they said fastest or even best. They might have been able to get away with it, but saying real, I mean, what is real? Well, they're not going to take three side because that means that all the ad- all the five G adverts that have gone out are misleading. Um, what all the all other the BT ones? and Vodafone adverts that have, have gone out? Oh yeah, we're because offering if it's 5G not real, services are misleading. Yeah, yeah, yeah So they're yeah. not going to take three side. Well, exactly. So and yeah. it also means all the five G adverts that have gone out around the world are misleading because they're anybody, all not real. Really anybody's got hundred million. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's good point. Point. To me, so, if if someone says um, we are launching the real five G, I I would um, associate with, for example, standalone. Then you have five G core and five. Well, there's RAM. that as well. Yeah, so that's it's very um, ill defined. I mean, exactly, I mean, yeah. that advert will probably have to be changed. I think. There's, there's yeah. a kebab place near my place that says best kebab in London. Should I yeah. report them? Well, important to ASA. Well, actually, I got that. I've got one little, one more little moan about <laughs> ASA that I'm going to sign off on, which is earlier on this week that um, ASA did two ad campaigns for something to paraphrase, sort of perpetuating gender stereotypes. Now, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of identity politics and all that sort of thing, but is it the Advertising Standards Authority? And I remember I wrote this up when they first passed, when they first made this rule earlier on in the year, and they said we, we're going to ban ads that perpetuate gender stereotypes because they can limit people's p- potential. Now, whether or not that's true, and I question whether or not that's true, whether whether an ad that's got a woman next to a pram or a bloke chopping a tree necessarily has any more broader effect, I'll question. But even if hypothetically it was true, is it the job of the Advertising Standards Authority to try and engineer society such that everyone can achieve their potential? Or is it their job to see whether or not people are telling lies in ads? It's bloody ridiculous. Yeah. 
the well, latter. On that bombshell. Yeah, <laughs> on that bombshell. Good. <laughs> Rant over. Um, thanks for being with us. A bit compressed there, but Tell we... Tell us in the comments if you... <laughs> but the beer's not going to drink itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so what do you think? Tell us in the comments. Um, so thanks for bearing with us, and make sure you join us for the next one. Cheers.